Well, good morning. What a beautiful day. I just had to stand out in my driveway a little bit, just a few minutes, just to enjoy the day this morning. Just uh, what a great day, great way to begin <clears throat> the Lord's day. So good to see everybody here this morning for Bible study. Hopefully we'll have a good Bible study this morning. Uh, we'll probably make mention of this again, uh, but just so you know, we, you've noticed that the screen is not working, and uh, we think it probably died the death. Uh, we have new screens that are uh, on being delivered tomorrow, actually. And new projectors that are on order, and they should be installed sometime this month. So we just didn't, I don't know if there's a part that's gone bad in these, or we don't know exactly, but we've gotten many years' use out of them. And they will be replaced shortly. So we'll limp along as best we can. This side might have to use their songbooks a little bit more, at least for a couple of weeks. But we'll get it all straightened out. For too long. Uh, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for a good night's rest and being able to be here in Bible study this morning on the Lord's Day. We pray that uh, as we worship you today, that our hymns and our offerings and our edification in your word will be acceptable to you. We pray that our fellowship will be encouraging to one another and that we will be strengthened uh, this coming week to be a light for you in the city of Jackson or wherever we find ourselves this week. We pray, Father, for your blessings upon this nation. We know, Father, by the things that we see, and we just know through history of man's rebellious nature, that we are not worthy of your blessings. But we know, Father, that you are attentive to our prayers and that in your will you will have good things happen to bless your people as we serve you, not for our selfish needs or wants or desires, but so that we can be more effective in serving you and seeking and saving the lost. Father, we're so grateful for your kindness and your grace towards us and your long suffering with our weaknesses and our sins and shortcomings and lack of attention at times and negligence. Father, we ask you to continue being patient with us and help us to have a heart to want to please you. These things we ask in the precious name and by the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. So, uh, the, the last month or so, our Sunday morning Bible class has been kind of choppy. We've had a lot of interruptions of a good nature, but we need to kind of wrap up where we've been and proceed kind of to the next phase of our study. We've been looking at this uh, church at Ephesus, and uh, we were spending some time looking at this farewell speech that Paul has, this discourse he, he has with the elders from Ephesus. And uh, you'll note we were spending, that we were looking at that section in uh, Acts chapter 20, and we, we noted <coughs> that that discourse was kind of, okay, we don't want them all to go out. Uh, the discourse uh, was divided into four sections. He rehearsed his personal history with them, how he had worked and labored with, with that congregation for three years. Then he talked about his future plans. He's going to Jerusalem. He doesn't know what's going to happen, but he's been warned by the Holy Spirit that bad things are in his future. 
But what a soldier, what a, what a servant Paul is that in spite of these warnings, he puts his shoulder to the wheel, he continues his path. He's not deterred by criticism or persecution or gossip or the naysayers who would undermine him. But he's going to do what's right. He's going to fulfill his mission. There's a little story. Just thinking about this word mission that Paul was on. There's a little story I would encourage you to find and read. You can find it on the internet. It's called... A mission to Garcia. I used to uh, read this to my boys. And it had to do with an event that happened during the Spanish-American War where a certain uh, critical message... Uh, actually, that's the title, A Message to Garcia. There was a general down on in Cuba with the resistance and the American president needed to get a message. There was no telegraph, there was no email, there was no way to get a message to him. And he called in and they said, uh, we need somebody to take this mission on, to deliver this message to Garcia. And the whole point of this little story is the it was highlighting the character of this man who volunteered on this perilous, dangerous, difficult journey. And the whole point of the article is where is that kind of character today? People who will, without Gore-Tex, wade through the swamps. Right? This was a difficult time, a difficult task. Well, this is, this is uh, Paul, and he's going to go th on this mission on behalf of the Gentiles, on behalf of the Jews, this mission to the city of Jerusalem. He then warns of apostasy, and uh, the very first stop in delivering warnings is to the elders themselves. They've got a mission. They've got a job to do. And it's to tend the flock. And he says, be careful. Because after I'm gone, after the restraining influence of divine, appointed, divine, apostolic authority is gone. There's going to be people who will take advantage of my absence. And he says, some even from among your own selves. And so he gives this warning to tend the flock. Do your job as elders. Beware of these ravening wolves that will try to come in and for their own personal reasons, whatever those reasons are, they're going to destroy the flock. So this, this warning against the apostasy and then he gives these exhortations to be faithful, encouraging words and blessings that will be attached to those who are faithful. So we kind of wrap that up. And uh, we spent some time talking about some various things. And in relation to this, I'll just as a, as a matter of review, right? Attitudes for the elders. Number one, they need to distinguish between sheep and wolves. And uh, this really has to do with attitudes. We, we need to show compassion, right, to the sheep. We value people over policy, over Legalism. What is legalism? Remember we talked about what legalism is? Legalism is going beyond the law, where you invent law. 
right, to, to control the people. And sometimes that, well, not sometimes, that hurts the sheep. So it's important to value the sheep. This is one of Christ's big condemnation against the Pharisees who were allegedly the shepherds in Israel. Value the one sheep. What sheep doesn't count? What sheep doesn't matter? Now, I know it's very, very difficult, right, as an elder to to know exactly what's going on in every sheep of the congregation's life. It's hard. It's hard, especially a congregation of this size. But we should never have a sheep feeling like they don't matter. Now we need to be careful about how we talk, that doesn't mean every sheep carries the same weight either because there are some sheep that are actually wolves. They look like sheep, but they don't act like sheep. So we need to, though, value the one sheep. We need to rejoice with people. We need to know them by name, and we need to develop trust. Trust is something the sheep depend on, and it's very easy for a shepherd to destroy trust. So this is these are some of the things that are important. We've reviewed, we're just reviewing now. What is the shepherd's attitude towards the wolf? Well, the first uh, first attitude is to know that there are such things as wolves. There are wolves. We need to understand the nature of the wolf. Their methods. They don't show up like wolves. They, they talk like one of the sheep. And oh, they can get your sympathies going. And you have to be careful. You, don't need, you need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, but you need to understand the method of the wolf. The good shepherds guard the door. Jesus will talk about this. We're going we're to come back to it, about those who try to climb in over the wall. They don't want to come in through the front door. Why? Because there's somebody there guarding it. They don't run. There's a lot of ways shepherds can run. The hireling runs. The hireling is not a word that's used in a good sense in the Bible. The hireling runs. And you know what? The wolves will sacrifice to protect the sheep. Jesus said he would lay down his life for the sheep. We don't really expect that. At least I'm not looking at it this morning. But you know what? If, uh, if the shepherd won't stand up to the least little bit of criticism, he's not going to sacrifice, lay down his life. Sometimes being a shepherd means you you take some hard shots. That's the way it is. So we got to figure out what it means to be a good shepherd. But, you know, as I was thinking, and I had this prepared uh, from our last class. I didn't get to it. Here's all the things it says about being a good shepherd. Does the Bible say anything at all about being a good sheep? What does it mean to be a good sheep? Now, we don't like that. If, 
if I said it like this, you all need to be good sheep. That, that kind of has a negative connotation because sometimes the word sheep is applied to people who just follow somebody blindly. That's not, that's being a sheep. That's not being a good sheep. See, there's a reason these metaphors are used. These, some of these similes are used. And a lot of times animals are used in terms of their uh, nature. It doesn't mean everything about that animal should be applied in every circumstance. You know, like the word chicken, right? Nobody likes being called a chicken, do they? You're a chicken. Jesus says, I would have loved to be a chicken for you. Like a, like a hen who gathers her chicks under her and protects her. A metaphor can have both negative uses and positive uses. So there's a good way to be a good sheep. Sometimes the word lion is used to describe Satan. He's a roaring lion. But Jesus says, I am the lion of the tribe of Judah. Right? So let's not be offended by the word sheep because this is the metaphor that Christ used. To describe his people and his leadership. So let's first talk about who. Who needs to be a sheep? This is a very simple lesson. I'm not, I'm not this is not big words here. Who needs to be a sheep? Well, first of all, elders need to be sheep. Now, that's kind of a mixed metaphor because they're talked about as being the, uh, the, the shepherds, right? But you can't be a good shepherd. Listen to this. You can't be a good shepherd if you don't know how to be a good sheep. We won't spend a lot of time on this because we've already dealt a lot about Shepherds, but turn with me to First Peter chapter five. <clears throat> the elders, therefore, among you, I exhort. I'm a fellow elder, Peter says, and witness of the sufferings of Christ, whom I am also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So that's who I am. I'm talking to you. I'm, 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 I know where you're at. I've sat right there beside you in those elder meetings, right? But he says, tend the flock of God. Again, here's this metaphor that's used. He said, which is uh, among you exercising the oversight or working properly, administering the oversight? And then he noticed this, these uh, four or three different motivations that might enter into the picture. One, somebody's twisted your arm to be an elder. And so you find it very laborious and stressful. And, well, it is laborious and it is stressful. But that's the way you look at it. I got to be this. I, they, they forced me to do it. They, they voted me in. Here I am. Nobody else would do it. I stepped up. No. You're not qualified to be an elder if that's your attitude. Next. Not because of filthy lucre. Well, that's a, that's a strong language there. That is some sort. You're getting something out of it. Physically, and it's, it's brought to mind this idea of financial reward, but there's all kinds of rewards that might appeal to people. Jesus once warned his disciples against all 
all forms of covetousness. Right? So don't serve out of a form of covetousness. But of a ready mind. See, that's being a good sheep. My mind is ready. Why? To listen to the Lord, to do what he says, to be strong in my role for him. And notice this, uh, neither as lording it over the charge allotted to you, there's been a charge apportioned to you. You don't have control over the whole flock. You've been given a specific, limited scope of authority. And don't get your britches too big. That's what my dad told me more than once. Uh, but notice this, verse 4. And when the chief shepherd shall be manifest. You see, you see that chief shepherd? There's the shepherds, and then there's the chief shepherd. So the elders have to learn how to follow the chief shepherd. Very, very important. Who else? Who else needs to uh, be a good sheep? Deacons. Turn with me to 1 Timothy 3, 12. Talking about these deacons and giving the qualifications of deacons, notice uh, this, uh, verse 13. After giving all these different qualifications of this role of, of special service, he says, for they that have served well as deacons gain themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Serve well. They're good sheep. They have served well under elders. They don't get confused about who's the elder and who's the deacon. But they have put their shoulder to the wheel. They do a good job. And it says that when they serve well, then they get great standing before the Lord and great boldness. Very important for deacons to be good sheep. I've, uh, I've had a phone call recently uh, from a congregation in another state. There's trouble in the eldership and the deacons, at least a small group of them, have started asserting themselves, trying to really take the place of elders. Mm -mm -mm. See, we don't... A lot of people don't like lessons like this because it actually deals with scope of, and authority. And we have a society that they don't care anything at all about authority. And unfortunately, there's some members of the church that just don't, they've been influenced. So I really appreciated uh, Brother Sammy Jones this past week and some of the lessons that he presented very, very much needed in every congregation. What about the minister? Does the minister need to be a good sheep? Absolutely. Absolutely. What good is a minister who can teach it but can't act it? Right? So 
You can look at passages like 1 Timothy 4, the same uh, book. Look at verse 6. If you put the brethren in mind of these things, he's talking about all the things that he told Timothy to be preaching about being righteous and holy, living out the word in your life, being sanctified. We heard that word this past week, being sanctified before the people. If you do this, if you put the brethren in mind of these things, you shall be a good minister of Christ Jesus. Nourished in the words of faith. Now this is talking about not only the people, but the Minister himself should be nourished, fed in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which thou hast followed. And then he gives him some more admonitions. But notice this, that there is a, there is a place, right, for being a good sheep, even for the minister. Yes, sometimes it's hard. You're up there in front of everybody. You're considered the leader, and uh, you, you uh, develop relationships. But there has to be a certain level of self-discipline. And then, of course, members. Every member needs to be a good sheep. And I'm reminded of the passage in Ephesians chapter 4 where he talks about the unity of the body. And uh, he talks about this, uh, the flock of God, uh, in different terms. He talks about it as a body. There's a head, and then there's the body, and each several part doing its job, contributing to the whole. That's called being a good sheep. When the eye doesn't think it's an ear, when the arm doesn't think it's a lung, right? Each part plays an important part, but it plays a part, working together for the unity of the whole. So these metaphors are very important. Now, uh, in the time we have left, and this will be the last we talk about this, we're going to go on to uh, another aspect next week. But, but I would just... Uh, <clears throat> I'd highlight um, this important warning for the flock, for the flock of God, is what we said before, there's about being good sheep, there's a good flock, and there's what's called a bad flock. Now, this, is, this gets into some pretty harsh language. Now, it's not my language, right? This is just warnings. The prophet Zechariah called the bad flock, right? He called it this. Listen, the flock of slaughter. Zechariah didn't call it that. He was just delivering the message. God called it the flock of slaughter. Turn with me to Zechariah chapter 11. Open your doors, O Lebanon, that fire may devour your cedars. Cry, weep, O fir trees, for the cedar is fallen. You know what that means? If the big cedar's fallen, you little fir trees don't expect to escape. Because the goodly ones are destroyed. Wail, O ye oaks of Bashan, for the strong 
forest is come down. A voice of the wailing of the shepherds, for their glory is destroyed. A voice of the roaring young lions, for the pride of the Jordan is laid waste. Thus saith Jehovah my God, feed the flock of slaughter, slaughter, whose possessors slay them, hold themselves not guilty, and they that sell them, they say, blessed be the Lord, for I am rich. You get the metaphor here? There were no good shepherds who were buying and trading God's flock. And he says, we're not going to go through the whole thing here, but he goes through and just, he has nothing good to say about the shepherds and he has nothing good to say about the, shop, the, the sheep because they followed the bad shepherds. So, and this is a, this is a prophecy really of the, of the nation of Israel and their slaughter of his son. Think about that. These people who said, oh, we're the flock of God. Oh, great is the Lord. They would speak good things about the Lord. But in the end, they were just self-dealing, Right. And what produced was a, uh, was a flock that was ready for the slaughter. And you go down through here and he says, well, give me my price. Give me my price. And so they weighed out for me 30 pieces of silver. You remember that? What, that? what does that have reference to? Judas. But notice this, he said, verse 7, So I fed the flock of slaughter, very, even the poor of the flock. And I took them to me two staves, the one I called beauty or grace, and the other I called bands or law, if you want to use it that way. And I fed the flock. So this is a bad flock under consideration. And I only bring this to our attention that you know, it's all fine and good to, to rehearse the good things about a, a flock. But we should, all, we should never forget the warnings either, right? Can't all be warnings. Can't all be glory. It's got to be balance. So what are the features of good sheep? That's what we're talking about. How to be a good sheep. How to be a good sheep. Number one, it's okay to be a sheep. That's the first thing about being a sheep is to be okay with being a sheep. I don't like this sheep talk. It's okay. It's okay to be a sheep. Number two, you need to know the shepherd. You need to know the shepherd. You need to know who the shepherd is. You need to know who the good shepherd is. Right? So that's important to know who the shepherd is. Those Jews... They got swayed from one minute, it, 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 in less than a week's time, they went from singing Hosanna, Hosanna to the Christ to saying, crucify him, crucify him. Why? Because they were easily swayed by the wrong shepherd. Easily swayed by the wrong shepherd. <sighs> they need to listen to the shepherd shepherd and that means more than just to hear it means you listen you follow you trust you heed the shepherd or shepherds right the good ones good shepherds if you got good shepherds listen to them what's the opposite uh Complaining, murmuring, 
You know what murmuring got the flock of God in the wilderness? Forty years walking around in their own graveyards. Do the math. Do the math about how many people a day died in the wilderness. You think about how many grown men, 600 some odd thousand men of war, not to mention the women of age, not to mention the elderly. Do your math, million, two million adults all died in the wilderness in a matter of 40 years. How many funerals a day were they doing on average? And why? Because they murmured against the Lord and his divinely appointed authority. See, good, good sheep listen and follow good shepherds. Number four, uh, how should I? I have a note here, but I want to say it a different way. Um, they follow instead of wandering. Yeah, it's called the grass is always greener syndrome. So, uh, You've probably known people that the minute they get upset about something, they'll switch to some other congregation. Now, they jump to a different flock. Or they just get weak and just drift away. Right? So they wander. Well, good sheep don't wander. Now, the good shepherd goes after those who wander. And, hey, can we help you? Can we encourage you? What can we do? I love you. I'm, we're interested in you. Right? We try to give, but uh, a good sheep doesn't wander. They, they know where the good shepherd is. They know where the door is. They know where the sheepfold is. And they follow. This is what Jesus says in that, that context of uh, John 10. He's, he has this debate with the Pharisees, and they're going back and forth, back and forth. What is the context of that debate? Here's the context. In John chapter 9, Jesus sees a man who's a, he's a beggar. He's blind. He's been, he was born blind. And he says, uh, would you like to be healed? The man says, oh, of course. Who can do that? And so Jesus spits on the ground. He makes a little bit of mud, a little bit of clay, and he wipes it on his eyes. He says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. The man goes wash. He wipes the, when he cleans the mud out of his eyes, he can see. And when the Pharisees hear about this, right, you know what their murmuring complaint was? What got them so mad? He washed his eyes out on the Sabbath day. He told you to do that. He made mud. He healed you on the Sabbath day. Oh, they were infuriated. Right in this context, they, uh, not long after this, they're picking up stones to kill him. And they start on this campaign. They're going to go back and forth, and they're going to say, you know, who did this? Who did what? And he, they bring the blind guy in. Well, who did this to you? When did he do it? They knew. And this poor, formerly blind guy says, look, I don't, I don't know who he was. I never even saw him. By the time I could see, he was gone. But I know this. Whoever healed a blind man born that way in all of history? See, he had the makings of a good sheep because he could think. And he started putting things together. And when Jesus comes back and says, would you become a disciple 
of the Son of God? He says, tell me who he was. I, if I knew who he was, he said, it's who you're looking at right now, who you're listening to right now, the one who made you to be able to see. And it says, and in that moment, he worshiped Christ. Makings of a good sheep. Pharisees, not so much. Because they didn't care what the facts were. They didn't have any kind of spiritual depth to make a, an assessment. They were just looking to throw stones. And you know what the sad thing was? Even the boys, I say the boy, he was a man. Even the man's parents were so afraid, so afraid of the malcontents, they wouldn't even stand up for their own son. They wouldn't even speak to, they, well, yeah, he was, he was born blind. We could, but as to what these circumstances are and what happened, we don't know. We don't know. They're like Schultz, remember the old TV show? I know nothing. Right? Ask him. He's of age. Don't talk. Don't bother us. And it says because they were afraid of the malcontents. Not much good to say about that. But then Jesus, that's the context of where Jesus starts talking about what it means to be a good sheep and a good shepherd. So these are things that we need to weigh carefully in our hearts. And think about our roles in this, uh, this congregation. Remember the whole point of studying these, these congregations in the New Testament is because there are things that we need to emulate about them. There are things that we need to avoid. And the, and the Apostle Paul is giving these warnings that, that apply to every congregation. Every congregation. And right now, in this congregation, we're going through a major, major transition point. And it is up to us, no matter who we are, elders, deacons, ministers, work together to be dedicated to the chief shepherd above everything else. To work for unity, to work for positive things, spiritual things, not to be sidetracked by other things less admirable. That's my mission. That's my goal. I hope it's all of ours. And I know by the looks on your faces, so many of you are so, so appreciative of this lesson, of these elders, of the good workers in this congregation. I know good things, I know good things are in store for this congregation. I know it. And I'm excited, and I hope you will be too in the days and months and years to come. Amen, lights? Oh, I tried. Thank you for being here this morning. Let's break for our intermission.